Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. Today in the studio, we are very pleased to welcome Ulrich Kuhn, Uli, as uh, some of us call him. Uh, he heads up the Arms Control and Emerging Technologies Program at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. And he's founder of the U.S.-Russia-German Deep Cuts Commission. The things that are being cut in this case are nuclear weapons. So, Uli, you're a European who does arms control. How much of an appetite is there for arms control in Europe? Well, it depends on where you're going. First of all, thanks for having me here, mm-hmm. Olya and Hugh. It's great to be back in Brussels. I really love it, particularly if you know you get a beer before and chocolates afterwards. So quite a treat. <laughs> um, arms control, not so much a treat these mm-hmm. days, to be honest, because, how shall I put it? There are certain countries in Europe that do believe that arms control is or should be an integral part to European security architecture writ large. Meaning, of course, you need to have military capabilities, you need to have defense strategies, but you also need to have kind of an outreach strategy, a diplomatic way of approaching the issues of war and peace. And then you have others in Europe that think that this is misguided and that particularly with view to Russia, you basically have to push back as hard as possible. And those ones are the ones that are currently, I'd say, dictating the terms because they're not just sitting in Europe. They're also very much sitting in the White House in the U.S. So in Europe, when people talk about arms control, are they thinking about nuclear arms control between the United States and Russia? Are they thinking about conventional limits that could actually involve European states themselves? What's, what's the debate about? So that's a good point you're raising, because I'm not sure that everyone's familiar with the concept of arms control. It basically means that, first of all, States are relying on armed forces, on arms, on strategies, how to employ the military and so forth. So all political ways of coming to an agreement how to basically cap these capabilities, whether it's the arms themselves or it's the employment strategies, the doctrines, that is called arms control. And a lot of the arms control these days is focused on nuclear issues because that's what's going on between the big power states. This is where it matters. This, Those are the arms that in the worst case of all might kill us all, you know, Armageddon. Mm-hmm. But below that level, you have all those states that have their tanks and their rifles and their armored combat vehicles and helicopters and fighter planes. So that is called conventional arms control. And in Europe, there is a great deal of debate about what can we do with these instruments? I mean, shall we engage on nuclear arms control? Shall we engage on conventional arms control? And I personally believe that uh, for Europe, it would be best to do both. But quite difficult right now. As an outsider to these debates, it seems that you must be struggling at the moment, Uli, because I'm not conscious of any great round of talks on any of these uh, arms control matters towards a treaty, away from a treaty. I sometimes read about treaties being in danger. But so what is it that the arms control world is focusing its energy on? Well, you're right, Hugh. I would say it's an age of depression that we have just entered as arms controllers because there have been many, many arms control treaties that have been fought during the 1970s, some during the late 1980s, and a lot of them, particularly after the end of the Cold War. You know, when the big powers... NATO, the Warsaw uh, Pact, the Soviet Union and the United States agreed, all right, okay, we need to change something about our behavior. We don't want to go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that stuff. We need to have some arrangements in place that make sure that we don't kill each other. That was the time when countries invested a lot of effort in arms control. And these days we're seeing exactly the opposite. That is states dismantling these agreements. The United States, but also Russia, getting out of those agreements, scrapping them, pretending they're not important anymore. And the problem is that those countries for which the treaties matter most, 
those ones that are in Europe, they don't really have a say in that anymore. They are just bystanders that can't do much about it. And that's actually not just depressing, it's sad. So the death of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which wasn't just about nuclear forces, but really just about intermediate range missiles, that has implications for Europe, or does it? I mean, there's an argument to be made that the treaty was out of date, that it constrained the United States and Russia in a way didn't constrain anybody else, that the European countries were actually free to build intermediate range missiles, really, if they wanted to so much. Do you think that the death of that treaty has made a real difference? And has it energized any of the discussions in Europe? We will see, Alia. I mean, what was the reason actually why we got the INF Treaty in the first place. Let's remember that it was back in 1987, so yeah. quite a while ago, Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan agreeing we need to get rid of a whole entire generation of arms. So this is not just an arms control treaty, it's a disarmament treaty. It's basically going down to zero. And they decided to get rid of a certain generation of missiles, those ones that fly at intermediate ranges. Basically, the missiles that the Russians could shoot towards Europe or the Europeans back to the Russians. Missiles with extremely short warning times. At some point, Mikhail Gorbachev said, these kind of missiles, it's like you're putting a gun to my head with a trigger and I can feel it because it's only five minutes warning times. Meaning, once you shoot the missile, let's say from Europe to Russia, the Russian general receives notification and he has five minutes to decide on nuclear holocaust or not. So, what if it was just a mistake? What if it was a misunderstanding? We don't know. And these missiles, I fear, are coming back. But the Russian gun was pointed not at the United States in this case, but at Europe. Yeah, the hostage. The uh, so it's, you know, so the United States and the Russians negotiated the treaty. The threat was in part to Russia, but the other threat was to Germany, to France. Well, I mean, some people forget it was not just the Russians and the Americans. The Germans, West Germany, they had a couple of INF range missiles and they also got rid of these missiles. So one could ask, if you're in a bad mood, you could ask German policymakers, okay, if the INF treaty now is dead, if the Russians have these missiles again, if the Americans are developing them, would the Germans get these missiles? I doubt it. But this is where I'm getting to, you know, we are back in an age of real serious competition fought out with nuclear or conventional missiles. That's not the world I want to go back to. Well, the, the world is definitely changing very fast because back in 1987, who was thinking of cyber attacks and who was thinking of all the stealthy things that are going on around that space and so forth? Um, is there any appetite now in your world to put everything on the table and discuss with everyone? Or is there a feeling that it's getting out of control, that there are so many actors moving onto the stage that uh, we can't possibly cope with everything? So we're just going to look after our own narrow interests as each nation state. Yeah, that's unfortunately, that's the case, You, I mean, we are going back to that age where restraint is not en vogue anymore. It's gone. And it's not just the big states. It's not just Vladimir Putin who is developing new missile after new missile. It's not Trump threatening other nations, you know, killing high-ranking officers like in the case of Soleimani in Iran. It's also other countries, regional powers like Turkey or perhaps countries like Poland that say we're not interested in these cooperative mechanisms anymore. Of course, they are not openly saying we don't like cooperation because that would be bad, you know. But the point is, when you look at the policies, the policies are geared towards power, strength, pushing back but not to talking with each other. And that's the prerequisite for arms control. This is why arms control is in such a bad shape. But often, historically, the reason countries came to the table to talk to each other was because they freaked each other out by not talking, right? You get scared enough and you come back to the table. I suppose the might... Does that mean we need to be at that point again? We're freaking each other one, out? One would hope not. And yet, <laughs> I do think this is one of the challenges is that arms control means agreeing to constrain yourself in order to constrain somebody else. Sure. And sometimes it's sneakily agreeing to constrain yourself because it's a way of constraining your military industrial complex and keeping the tax contributions of your citizens from getting wasted on things that aren't necessary. But that's a sneaky secondary aspect of it. Yeah. But I think there's another challenge here that 
we haven't hit upon, we talk about the Europeans and we talk about individual countries and these aren't the same things. I mean, is it even possible to have a European perspective on arms control or is it only possible to have a couple of dozen European perspectives on arms control? Yeah, this is something that very much concerns me because historically seen, there have been a couple of agreements and you have mentioned the INF treaty in the nuclear realm. There has an, has been another treaty that is more or less dormant, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe mm -hmm. or CFE treaty, which was limiting the conventional forces, meaning the tanks and all that stuff between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. Also, very important for European security. So, These treaties are gone. And the question is, would Europe benefit from having those kind of agreements? And if so, who should negotiate these agreements? Because obviously the man in the White House, they won't do it. I'm not so sure about the Russian side. I think there might be a certain interest on the Russian side. But the more basic or I would say perhaps even philosophical point about is if Europe wants to negotiate these issues with Russia, then Europe needs to have a certain strength, political strength. That means Europeans need to be united on this issue, but also military strength where the countries in Eastern Europe, like Poland, like the three Baltic states or Romania, where they are actually sure about that the rest of Europe would come to their defense if Russia ever were to do something aggressive against Eastern Europe. If we have that confidence on a political and military level, I think then Europe could be its own autonomous arms control actor. But honestly, that's a long way to go. I mean, you just said that's falling apart, right? That there is this notion of cooperation and coordination is... Well, Fading. cooperation right now is falling apart, but it's mainly the cooperation between NATO and Russia and the United States and Russia. I think there are actors in Europe that are interested in cooperation with the Russians. And I think that even parts of the Russian political leadership are also interested in cooperation with the Europeans. So at the forefront of these arguments for a new engagement with uh, Russia more recently have been the French or the yeah. French leadership. Emmanuel Macron thinks – or seems to think, that he may be the one who can start some of these negotiations. What do you think of that? Well, <laughs> a lot of bold initiatives are coming from Paris these days. Sometimes I would wish for initiatives that are not so bold, not so much about visions, but more about what's technically and politically feasible. What I like about Macron is he thinks outside of the usual quarters. Macron has understood that geography will never change in Europe. Russia is not going away. Wherever the United States is going during the next 20 years, is it going to be a retreat from Europe, meaning to withdraw all forces because the U.S. might be facing a serious conflict with China in East Asia or what not? He knows Russia is not going away and the Europeans might be left on their own devices. So they need to come together. And so Macron also sees a quite de Gaullean nationalistic opportunity for France to step in and be the leader. Germany, my own country, is not a political leader in Europe these days, particularly not on issues of security and defense. But Macron sees uh, the opportunity For France and for Europe, I think he really believes that Europe needs to be its own powerful standing actor in the world, next to Russia, next to United States, next to China. So he sees the opportunity. But the problem is, I heard from one diplomat at a point that while Germany has all the potential allies, but is reluctant to lead, France wants to lead, but it has not the allies. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we're talking to Ulrich Kuhn, who heads the Arms Control and Emerging Technologies Program at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. So how would negotiations between Europeans in whole or in part and Russia work? I mean, I think the notion of negotiating a new CFE treaty, Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, 
with everyone at the table just creates a migraine, right? I mean, the very thought of it makes everyone want to hide under their desks. Are there subcomponents, though, that could be negotiated? Could you negotiate a Black Sea security arrangement that takes into account the challenges of Russia's occupation of Crimea? Could you do something in the Baltics that helps to reassure the Baltic countries but also Russia, which has Kaliningrad, that would be the obvious target for any for a Western attack in case of any conflict. Are there ways to do this piecemeal if you can't do it all together? Absolutely. It's basically it, the typical way of doing negotiations is, first of all, you identify what are the interests. What are the interests or the potential interests that Russia might have in such negotiations? What are the interests of the Europeans? Obviously, when you look at Europe, that gets more complicated because you have up to 30 interests in the room, sometimes even more. I would say that there are some areas where I see little, perhaps technical agreements providing for a bit more confidence and trust between mm -hmm. the sides. INF is one of those issues. Me and my team in Hamburg, we're, for instance, working on compiling sets of verification measures, making sure, for instance, that the new INF range missiles that Russia is developing stay behind the Ural Mountains. Which is what Vladimir Putin has suggested as a short-term solution to this problem, right? Nobody well, deploys in Europe. Well, I don't want to get into, a, <laughs> into an argument with Vladimir Putin. Perhaps you invite him for the next episode. But the point <laughs> We'd love to have him. <laughs> <laughs> so this goes out to you, Vlad. <laughs> Hope you're listening. <laughs> So the point is basically, it's possible. We will show that into in an article that we will bring out in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. hopefully, fingers crossed. But the point is, he just said it. He did not follow up with serious uh, on-the-ground politics mm -hmm. on that. Another issue you mentioned is maritime security for the Baltic and the Black Sea. Those are the areas where we see oftentimes... Russian fighter aircraft getting getting little dog fights with mm -hmm. NATO and the ships, you know, they're cruising too close and all these right. issues. While for some that might look funny, I think it's those issues could get out of hand. But then ultimately there is the big question about what are we going to do with geographical space? So I'm not a scholar of geopolitics, but here it really matters, at least when we follow a main narrative on the Russian side. And that is, what are we doing with those countries that are not part of the European uh, Union and NATO? Shall they become big Switzerland's? We're talking here about Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Moldova. Or are those countries, will we find a modus vivendi between the Europeans and the Russians? But I would say that's the end of a potential mm -hmm. negotiation process. Perhaps we go back to a couple of principles that we already had from the 1970s. That is, for instance, non-intervention in internal af affairs of a state. That's something the Russians are very much interested in. And the other issue is respect for borders and sovereignty, which also means the Russians need to get out of Ukraine. We well, say that none of this works out and we continue along, along the fraying process that you described. It seems that we're entering into a world where, as we saw with the uh, drone strike against the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani, where the declared US goal was to re-establish deterrence. You as an arms control expert, you've studied deterrence uh, a lot, I imagine. If we are staying in this kind of laws of the jungle kind of world. What does deterrence mean? What does that mean for the Europeans and all these other Switzerlands, as you kindly described them, around the uh, European periphery? Well, to be honest, when we get into the debate about deterrence, and what is deterrence? I mean, deterrence is you putting a bouncer in front of the door of your club and showing everyone that if you want to enter and do bullshit in the club, you're going to pay for that. And so you just don't actually do it because the more threatening the bouncer looks like, the more sure you are, this is not going to work out. So perhaps I just go to another club. So this is what deterrence is all about. It happens in the imagination, in the mind of the other. So deterrence is working as long as it doesn't get to the point where you see real negative action, meaning where you really see a fight. Once you see a fight, deterrence has failed. So the question with regards to Europe here is, does deterrence matter in the European context? Is it successful? And what kind of deterrence do we need? And do we need more or do we need less? 
I would say when we look at Europe right now, we see a deterrence approach vis-a-vis -vis Russia that is more of an assurance approach, meaning NATO has put a very limited number of forces into the three Baltic states because those are the ones that are really afraid about the Russians because the Russians have way more soldiers in the field. But at the same time, it's good for the Baltic states to feel, you know, there are other states and particularly in the United States that are having our back that will step if the Russians at some point decide to attack us. So there I would say assurance works, deterrence, meh. I'm not really sure if the Russians are deterred by a couple of thousand soldiers. The real problem about deterrence in the European context is that deterrence is a communication disabler. Meaning, to get back to the bouncer, you're not going to start talking to the bouncer or the owner of that club saying, look, let's negotiate a way where I can get in and I promise I'm not going to behave badly or whatever. You just pass that club and go to the next club. That's the point. You're not talking. It's a disabler. People are not seriously talking with each other. NATO is not seriously talking to the Russians. The Russians are not seriously talking to the Americans. Why? Because they rely on their deterrence mechanisms. They rely on their armed forces. They are sure that they won't attack each other. But aside from that, nothing more is happening. And that also means... It's not going to change to the good. But arguably, that's fine, right? If you're the club, as long as insurance works, it's fine. If you're the club, you don't care that some random person who might or might not start fights is going to go bother some other club yeah, or go home and have a drink but that's in their the kitchen. Point, but, oh yeah, but that's the point about geography, mm -hmm. because we're not talking about a random person. We're talking about the Russians and we're talking about the Europeans. Right. So no, but I think what's really interesting about the evolution of deterrence is that everyone wants to deter the other guy, but nobody wants to be deterred. There was a grudging acceptance towards the end of the Cold War, at least among some, that mutual deterrence was okay. Maybe nobody was entirely happy with it, but there was some level of acknowledgement that this was how you kept the peace. I do think in the United States that's disappeared to a large extent, that we have a government in the United States that very much thinks deterrence is what we do. It is not what is done to us. The Russians, who are in the position of some weakness, would like to go back to mutual deterrence. They're okay with being deterred as long as the Americans are also deterred. And they're terrified at the idea that the Americans might not be. But I don't think they know how to get back to that place absent a new government in the United States. I don't know what the Europeans can do about that. Well, right now they cannot do much about it. I mean, you're basically right. Deterrence, when you look at it, it's not just depending on the viewpoint who deters whom, but it's basically a religion. If you're doing deterrence, you're believing in the right faith. That's it. If the other side is doing deterrence, then it's not deterrence. Then suddenly it is compellence. Just look at the case of Suleimani, the, the killing of the mm -hmm. general uh, a couple of days ago. The justification from the U.S. side was we have to reestablish deterrence, meaning the Iranians have come too close to the club, too close to the bouncer. So they shoot the general. What do the Iranians think about that? Well, I can tell you, the Iranians think we have to restore deterrence. They came too close to the club. They even killed the bouncer. We need to do something right. about well, this. And so this is, this is a negative mm -hmm. spiral. And I mean, you also have these principles of international law where you don't kill the other club's bouncers. Yeah, of course. But I'm here a bit more with the law of the jungle that mm -hmm. you refer to. Yeah. But the thing is about all this assurance and deterrence going on is that actually there's less of it going around. I spent a long time in Turkey and there the assurance given by NATO membership was a reason that Turkey did not go forward to develop its own nuclear weapons because it felt that the American umbrella was shielding it. And Turkey is just one example, I suppose, of many countries. I imagine Japan is thinking similar thoughts that used to be feel that they were covered by assurance deterrence mm. of the United States, but no longer feel that way. And therefore, as certainly pressures are building up, do you think we're going to see a lot more proliferation in the coming period if none of the arms control ideas you just uh, gave us don't work out? It looks like this, unfortunately. The question here would be, are we entering a new age of proliferation? It could be. And it could be that we see at some point states proliferating, meaning states acquiring nuclear weapons, where we did not expect them to do. And will uh, that make them safer? Ooh, that's a long debate. I'm clearly on the side of those that think 
it's not the more the merrier. Uh, it's the more the dangerous because you would have to calculate with many more leaders, weird leaders like Kim Jong-un or perhaps Recep Tayyip Erdogan at some point. So I think that world would be less secure, but perhaps that is going to happen. As a political scientist, I care about the, the dependent and the independent variable, meaning like who is starting something and what are the knock-on effects? And I think when we look at who starts something, it's the United States. It's all about the United States. Will the United States uphold its security guarantees for NATO member states, but also for certain states in the Middle East and in East Asia, or will they not? Donald Trump is rhetorically not really serious about security guarantees. He seems not interested. The politics on the ground at the moment looks different. But what about the next president? What if it's again Trump? What if he continues down that line? Or what if it's Bernie Sanders who says, let's bring back home all those troops because I don't care and the US is not a force for good in the world. I think then, then we might see other states proliferating and perhaps assuming nuclear capabilities. So the more the scarier. Yeah. So I am uh, very sad to say that I think we're out of time. I feel like we could continue this conversation for uh, at least another half hour, but then Uli would miss his flight and be very angry with us. So he could drink more beer. He could drink more beer and have some of the chocolate. Eat more chocolate, yeah. (laughs) But uh, I'm afraid uh, we are going to call a close to this episode and just have to invite you back at some point in the future. So thank you, Uli. And also in closing, we'd like to thank uh, Bull Media and uh, our producer, Antoine Leroux. We'd like to thank Miranda Sunnix, who always uh, makes sure that Hugh and I show up to the studio on time with appropriate notes. And as always, I want to thank all of our listeners. Thank you very much. And for more, you can see our website, www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group.